I'm Becky L. McCoy, and you're listening to Stories of Unfolding Grace, the podcast about grace during unexpected times. You'll hear from real people dealing with hard stuff, and I hope you'll feel encouraged that you can bravely live through hard stuff too. In today's episode, Amy Liebman is sharing the story of her divorce and what it was like to start over with her kids uh, after her and her husband separated. I'm here today with Amy Liebman from Carried by Hope. And Amy, why don't you share with us about this difficult season that you've gone through? Okay, um, in 2010... I was a 10-year military wife. We'd been in the military for 10 years, and we were stationed overseas, and I had three young children. And it was at that time while we were overseas that I found out that my husband had been having an affair. Mm -hmm. He had had an affair while he was on a deployment. And so we started to work through that. I believed in marriage being for a lifetime and grew up with a family who had never had anyone divorced. I didn't have any cousins that had ever been divorced or aunts or uncles, no one like that, and Mm -hmm. had been raised with the belief that, you know, marriage is for life. So I was determined to do whatever it took to keep my marriage together. So I went through a period of about nine months then just working through my marriage. My husband was not interested in going to counseling or anything like that, but I prayed a lot and tried everything that I could think of to keep our marriage together. And then about nine months after that, I found out that he was having another affair, and at this time it was with one of my closest friends there. So that was really devastating. Yeah. Oh, my Um, word. How did you react? Like, what was that like emotionally both times? I think it was just very surreal. I mean, mm. it, it felt like it was something that, you know, I just, like I said, I never thought that I would be in that situation. Um, when we got married, we both professed to be Christians. It was just not something that I had ever anticipated happening. And then um, I think that with the second one, I felt like I just, like I couldn't believe that it had happened. I questioned my own intelligence, you know, how how did I not see things? I had always felt like a fairly well-educated and intelligent person, and this made me feel like I had obviously just missed it, like I was totally naive and... Right. How old were your kids? Very smart. Um, They were 10 and 7 and 4. It's a, it's just so much to take in cuz yeah, you'd like to think that you could figure these things out. What did you struggle with most? I struggled with feeling like a failure because I again came from a background where divorce was just not part of the picture and it took me a really long time to even tell my family members that things were going on. So I was Mm. overseas all by myself and I didn't even want to tell them what was going on because I didn't want to worry them. And I knew that they weren't going to have any firsthand advice to give me about it. So I think I, I struggled with that feeling of failure and like, what did I, what could I have done to prevent this? Um, Which I think that most women who have to deal with infidelity feel like they must have missed something or done something to cause their husbands to to go looking for someone else. And, I mean, I was crushed. I think I was afraid of being alone. If I, I was pretty determined to save my marriage, but in the back of my mind, there was always that, well, what if, what if I, what if God doesn't heal my marriage? Mm. What then? 
And I had been a stay-at-home mom for 10 years, hadn't had a job. I didn't finish college because I got married when I was 19. So I struggling with just the fear of what happens next. I think that was the big thing if there were failure and fear. How do you feel like you handled those emotions? I think I handled them mostly just going to scripture. Mm. I eventually did talk to my family and a few close friends and started getting advice. Um, But I think just the scripture that I grew up with memorizing and hymns and songs were a big help. Um, I also didn't, you know, there was, didn't want my kids to know that anything was wrong. Right. Um, So there was a lot of, you know, crying in the bathroom (laughs) and things like that. I don't know. I remember just crying a lot in private and at night, but trying to keep things as normal as possible otherwise. Yeah, cuz if you're not even sure how to handle it, what are you going how are you going to help your kids? <laughs> like <laughs> Exactly. When you don't have any answers, what you know that they're going to have questions. So, yeah. you said so you guys were stationed overseas at this point and he, was he yeah. deployed from the overseas base? He had been, but he was there when I when found out found about out. the second affair. Mm-hmm. So, we Again, you know, tried to work through it for a few months, and because of the the nature of the affair, his job was sort of in jeopardy as well. You know, the military takes it pretty seriously. Yeah. And so he he kind of went back and forth, and still didn't want to go to counseling, um, and eventually decided that he thought that it would be a good idea if I just took the kids home to the states. It was in the summertime for a couple of weeks while he was dealing with some of the stuff and just see what happened after that. But while I, when I came back to the States for vacation, my parents set me up with a counselor here. And I read Dr. Dobson's book, Love Must Be Tough. She, the counselor had me read Love Must Be Tough, and I had already read it once and really hated it because I knew that it was right. <laughs> but I wasn't willing to take the step. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, at one point in reading it through the book across the room, I remember. I think that's the only time I've ever done that. Yeah. But I knew. And one of the things that, that both the counselor and the book said was that you really needed, that I really needed to draw a line and say, you really need to either do this or do this. Mm. And it was hard for me to do that. And. I remember the counselor saying, you know, well, why do you, why do you think that that's hard for you? And I said, well, because I already know what the answer is going to be. Mm-hmm. And so we talked on the phone one night, and I did say, you know, we, we need to go to counseling. This needs to happen. And sure enough, he said that he wasn't going to go to counseling, that he was not interested in us coming home at all. And that he definitely wanted a separation, and he was pretty sure that he would want a divorce. So I flew back the next week and gathered a few things by myself. And then the military sent our stuff later that year. Wow. How long ago was this? This was five years ago this Mm -hmm. month. Wow. So I actually flew back to pick up our things on our 11th anniversary. Yikes. So that's kind of a, you know, every year reminder of that. Yeah. Oh, my word. That's so hard. How did you, how did you have that conversation with your kids when, when you did, when it came time to talk about it? We had already, after I found out about the second affair, we had kind of had a conversation with the kids about the fact that things were not going well Mm -hmm. um, and that we might have to go home for a while, back to the States for a while. And so then when he made that decision, you know, we just sat down and I said, you know, kind of reminded them of the conversation that we had in the past and told them that, that daddy had made a decision that he didn't, you know, that we didn't think that we should come back right now and that we probably wouldn't go back at all. So they were already kind of 
aware of it. Mm -hmm. And my my oldest two were still pretty upset about it, of course, because they had yeah. friends there, and and you know, of course, they not getting to see their father anymore. But right. my youngest was he was only four, and I remember him saying he kind of looked at the other two and he said, "Well, I've already cried about this," <laughs> and so he just you know. Yeah, he was only four. He didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, so black and white. Yes. Wow. I get so excited to see people choosing to live bravely and authentically. Each week on Tuesdays and Fridays, I host a Facebook Live event to share more stories of people living bravely, and I want to hear your story, too. Join us at Facebook.com backslash Becky L. McCoy. share so much with you here on the podcast, but you can read my story and learn more about living bravely and authentically at my blog, beckylmccoy.com. Stop by and sign up to receive my monthly newsletter. It includes book recommendations and blog posts and podcast episodes you may have missed. Check the show notes for details. So I'm using this definition of grace as good things that happen during really difficult times. So how did you see mm-hmm. grace during during that time and since in the last five years? I think that even while it was going on and before I started to find out about the affairs, God put people in my life. He had become plugged into the chapel there at the base, and I had several good friends there who were not having an affair with my husband. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So they were still, they were already kind of in place when I needed them there. And then when I came back to the States, my family is wonderful and supportive. And the kids and I lived with my parents in a two bedroom townhouse for a year when we first came back. So the fact that they were willing to, to open up their home like that, you know, so small and you know, deal with little children in the house again for mm-hmm. a whole year was great. And then, I mean, financially, he has you know, just provided for us over and over again. And I have you know a section in my journal where I keep track of just things that he has provided for us. And it's I looked back over it the other day and. It's amazing how so often, like one time I said, I was, I went back to school. So I was going to school full time and I was working full time. I was going to school online. So I would do that at night after I had worked all day, but I needed, I had had to order textbooks and it was $174 for this textbook that I needed. And God had provided, he provided a job for me to make some little apple pies for this wedding for someone. And it ended up being $175 that I made. (laughs) So I had an extra dollar left. Yeah, a dollar to spare. For my textbook. (laughs) (laughs) And another time, God really impressed on me the importance of tithing. I had never been able to do that when we were married. My husband did not think that it was necessary or agree with it. And, of course, I was a stay-at-home mom, so I didn't actually make my own paycheck. So when I was making my own paycheck, that was one of the things that I decided was that, you know, God was going to provide for us and I was going to tithe. And one time in particular, I came to church and my bank account was really low and I knew that I was going to need to bring some food for a small group thing that night. But I decided that I still had to to do what was what I had been burden to do and that was to tithe and so I wrote my tithe check and put it in the offering and when I went to leave that day the lady behind me I had 
kept her dog for her the week before, and I really had just done it as a favor. Mm-hmm. I did not expect her to pay me at all. But she gave me a thank you note when I left the church building that day. And when I got out to the car and opened it up, there was $5 more than what I had put in the offering plate wow. in the envelope. So again, you know, like that time, God mm-hmm. didn't even let me leave the church without saying, you know, okay, you're, you're obedient. And I'm mm-hmm. so it's been a journey learning um, about his provision that way. And he gave me time that I, I still don't know where that time came from, but I went to school because now that I'm done, yeah. I <laughs> just can't figure out where I fit it in. Yeah. Oh, my word. I, I guess can only I just imagine. didn't sleep a lot more. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, you know, he seemed like he multiplied money. He multiplied time so that I could finish school. And that's provided, you know, for our emotional health mm-hmm. in many ways. Yeah. Like, I think one of the wonderful things about this podcast is it's like opening up the discussion that loss and grief isn't just when someone dies. Like, right. The whole life that you expected when you got married ended Mm -hmm. and you had to grieve that. What did it look like to grieve the end of your marriage? Felt a lot like a death. And I've, I went to a divorce support group and Mm. They talked a lot about that, the fact that divorce is a lot like a death, except that there's no there's no funeral, there's no real closure. You still have to interact with this person. Mm-hmm. You you realize that they made a choice instead of, you know, if, if someone dies, they don't make a choice to leave you. They, right. And in this case, they do. And so you have to deal with that um, rejection as well as the fact that they're gone. So... I mean, I definitely grieved. It was a process, just accepting it one step at a time, accepting that that we were separated, and then accepting the fact that right. he wanted a divorce and that I was a single mother. And you go through the same cycles of grief that you do with the death. And right. The, um, you know, I definitely had denial days and anger days. Mm-hmm. How did you choose to live bravely and authentically as a result of all of this? I remember within the first 24 hours after I found out about his second affair, I was just, I spent a lot of time that first 24 or 40 hours just in bed crying Mm -hmm. and like shaking uncontrollably. But I remember just saying, you know, I just don't understand God, you know, why... I realized that I don't need to know why this happened, but, you know, it's really hard not to ask you why it happened. And I just, I don't need to know, but I think that you understand that I want to ask why. Mm -hmm. And I really felt like he said to me then that he was going to use it and he would use it to help other people. And I had already started this one of the things that he had done in preparing me that year before when I was working the base chapel was working in women's ministry and I had seen the breakdown of marriages and how prevalent that is in the military yeah, all the time through the base. So I was already interested in ministering to women and I felt like he was saying, you know, you've been looking for answers to, to all of these issues and you can't find them because this is a new thing in the church, really, Mm -hmm. this prevalence of divorce and broken families. And we need people that that have experienced it and understand it to be able to help other people. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like he was saying that he would use it that way. And I was kind of horrified at that thought (laughs) (laughs) because I just, at that moment, I didn't even want to talk to my family about it, let alone anyone else. But he has slowly over the past five years, even before I started blogging and talking about it publicly, um, people would come up to me at work or at church and they, you know, just women that very quietly wanted to say to me, look, I, I know that you've been through this and I'm going through this and, and I talked to you about it. It's very 
difficult. I'm sure you know that when you've gone through a certain kind of grief and then someone comes to you with that and they're in the middle of that raw grief too, it's it's hard because you feel all those feelings all over again. Mm -hmm. But it's also a blessing to tell them that it's okay, it gets better, life is not over, and I can can bring you through this and put things back together, not the way that they were necessarily, but in a new way and in a beautiful way. What would you say to encourage someone in a similar situation, especially because, like you said, in the military, um, since we were in the Air Force, we saw it a lot that there, mm -hmm. there are families that are just like falling apart, which is interesting since the military tends to be mostly conservative people. For everyone, I would love to call attention to that fact that military marriages struggle so much mm -hmm. and that that is, if you could pray for people in the military, we always pray for their safety and yeah. things like that, but their, their marriages and their families need prayer as well. Mm -hmm. And then for women who are going through this, I would just say that they're not alone, that it feels very, very lonely, like you're the only person in the whole world who's ever gone through that pain, but you're not alone. And I looked for a lot of stories. I remember searching the internet for information, especially when I wasn't even talking to my family about it. And I found a lot of stories about people who fought for their marriages and God redeemed their marriage. And I loved reading those stories, and I think they're very important because people do need to fight for their marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think that God, that, that you reach a point where God says, okay, this is, and, and then you know very clearly that this is over and he helps you to move forward. But while you feel that need to an urge to fight, you should definitely fight for your marriage. But I can find those stories, but I couldn't really... It, it was more difficult to find stories of people who said, look, this didn't work. My marriage was not necessarily saved, but that wasn't the end of life for me. So I would say, you know, sometimes God doesn't heal your marriage, but that doesn't mean that he won't heal you. Mm -hmm. And the end of your marriage is not you know, the end of your happily ever after. There's, I, yeah. I remember thinking very clearly that, oh, well, there's no, there's not going to be any happily ever after for me. Marriage is not the be all and end all. I remember thinking that I had wanted my life to end up like a fairy tale. And mm -hmm. now it was ending up like a cautionary tale, which really bothered me. Yeah. But, I think that I'm okay with that now mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because that's that's the way that God is using it in my life. And he always wants and does the best for us. And I think of that too with my children. I am often tempted to think a whole family is best for them. You know, why did this happen to them? And then I'm reminded that God loves them more than I do. He knows mm -hmm. what's best for them. And this is the way that he's chosen to work in their lives. And he will use it um, for good for them. Yeah, even if you can't see it now. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Like you said, people, this is like a new topic for people to talk about. Like, how are we going to deal with divorce and and when marriages aren't reconciled? Um, so thank you for being mm -hmm. brave and sharing your story. I have a couple thank fun you. questions for you before we say goodbye. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the, okay. the first one is, what are you loving right now? I am loving the musical Hamilton right now. Mm. I know I'm like way behind the times. I know. Hey, I haven't been even... talking about it for like a year. Yeah, I studied <laughs> musical theater in college, and I still haven't listened to the soundtrack. So I think oh, <laughs> of wow. anyone, I should be like in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went on a road trip with a friend recently, and she had it, and she played it. Oh, awesome! And I just fell in love with it and my mother is a history teacher so I've always grown up with a great love of history yeah. so I started like fact checking everything in it and everything and I just I think it was brilliant it's definitely yeah. not a family friendly thing I won't be letting my children listen to it anytime soon right. but um, 
as far as the historical and the musical part of it go, I have been really yeah. loving that. That's cool. What's your favorite meal or snack right now? I love a really good burger and sweet mm. potato fries. Yes. And I like to try local places that have burgers. So I I would say that that's probably my all-time favorite meal. And what, then, do you, course, what do you like on your burger? Butter. I love avocado burgers. Pimento cheese here in the South is a big thing. Mm-hmm. So I've tried just about every pimento cheeseburger in town. But my favorite one is at a place in town, a local place in town, and it's called the Spicy Goat. And it has goat cheese and a pepper jelly on it. Which oh, my word. Delicious. Can you it ship that delicious. to Connecticut? <laughs> oh, I wish. It is so good. <laughs> That's awesome. What are you doing to take care of yourself? This summer, I have really been careful to take Sundays off. Mm. Um, I During the school year, it's really difficult when you only have the two days. They're yeah. home, and then kids have soccer games and all of this stuff on Saturday. And so I'm so you know, we go to church on Sunday, and then I have to come home on Sunday, and I either have to grocery shop or clean or whatever Mm -hmm. so in the summertime I have a little bit more flexibility in my work schedule because I work at a school so okay I get to um take a little bit more time off my weekends are a little longer Mm -hmm. so I've been making sure that I get that Sunday afternoon nap and you know lay around and watch Netflix read a book or right whatever and the last question is what are you doing to be brave being on this podcast. <laughs> sure. It's a little intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> sharing my sharing my story. I've um since January, like I said, you know, very early on I felt like God was telling me that he would use this. And then in January of this year, um, I started feeling like he was saying, Okay, now now's the time. Now it's time. You've you had five years, you know, you've come so far and now it's time to mm-hmm. talk about it. So um, I've been writing and learning more about writing and blogging, and um, so I would say those are my steps right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate you you taking that step of courage to share with us. Well, well thank you for what you do. I enjoy listening. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. While you're there, please rate, review, and share Stories of Unfolding Grace. When you give it five stars, it goes a huge way in helping other people find the podcasts by increasing my ranking. If you're interested in sharing your own story of unfolding grace, head to my blog, beckylmccoy.com backslash submissions. I can't wait to hear from you. Next week on Stories of Unfolding Grace is the live podcast episode. I'm so excited for you guys to hear our conversation. It was such a fun night. Um, Keep your eyes peeled. Check out the live podcast episode on the blog so that you can see pictures from the evening and uh, you can start making your plans to come to the next one whenever that is. Have a great week. Thanks again for joining me. I'm looking forward to next week.